For this presentation, I'm going to provide an overview of how analog and digital control loops relate to each other in order to further our basic understanding of digital control loops and the process of analyzing them. I'm also going to detail our solution at Venable Instruments as to how we perform the measurement and analysis of a feedback loop utilizing a digital controller and produce the required data to design a stable loop. In order to understand how we do loop analysis in the digital world, we first quickly look at how closed loop analysis is done in a purely analog system. We do a closed loop analysis using a three channel analyzer. The injection is performed across a low impedance injection resistor inserted into our loop in series. Channels one and two are attached on either side of the injection resistor to measure our total closed loop transfer function. Channel 3 is attached at a point between the error amplifier and the modulator. By doing this, the measurements of channel 1 and 3 give us the transfer function of the error amplifier, and the measurements for channel 2 and 3 give us the transfer function of the modulator. The closed loop setup has some considerations to be taken into account. We have to select a point in the feedback loop where the loop is confined to a single path to provide us our signal injection point. Typically, this point will also be used to measure our total feedback loop. Also, we want this point to be in a spot where you have a low impedance feeding into a high impedance in the feedback loop. This will typically be at the point where the output of the power stage feeds into the error amplifier. We have a basic procedure for stabilizing a loop for an analog system as follows. First, we measure or model the transfer function of the modulator section of the power supply. Then, we choose what we want the feedback loop bandwidth and phase margin to be. Finally, we design an error amplifier that will provide us a gain that is the inverse of the control to output gain at the chosen crossover frequency and has a phase lag that when added to the control to output phase lag will be less than 360 degrees by the desired phase margin. The process for stabilizing a digital loop is essentially the same as the analog process. Steps 1 and 2 remains the same. First, we will measure the control to output transfer function. The solutions that I will present here will demonstrate the ability to measure this directly, even though it is a combination of analog and digital measurements. Next, you decide on your bandwidth and phase margin. Then, finally, we will compute the compensation coefficients that will be programmed into the target processor to achieve the required gain and phase margins and then set them. So when we talk about a digital loop control application, we still have the same breakdown of stages as we do in the analog world. First is the modulator that will exist in the analog power stage with its gain at our chosen crossover frequency. Then we have the compensation stage that exists in the digital portion of our system with coefficients chosen to provide us with the inverse gain at the crossover frequency. These two stages summed together gives the total loop response of the system with the required phase margin at the point where the gain is unity. So this is essentially the same as the analog control loop. For the digital compensator stage, we have the same type 1, type 2, and type 3 implementations that we have in the analog solution. However, we add a new type, the proportional, integral, differential to this mix. For the PID, as shown here, we have our first segment with a pole at the origin. This is the integral portion of the transfer function. The second segment, the proportional, and the third segment, the differential portion of the transfer function. Although additional poles do exist in a PID controller, they will exist past the sampling frequency of the digital controller and can therefore be disregarded in our design considerations. One thing we can see right away is that the PID gives us a second zero at the frequency when we would normally want the second pole instead. Now, because of this, the differential portion of the PID feedback will typically produce an undesirable transfer function. As a result, you will often see it coupled with a second stage pole filter. This combination allows the use of a PID to create a more favorable feedback transfer function. As you can see in the chart, the use of a two-pole second stage filter allows us to achieve a transfer function similar to a type 2 amplifier. Optimum placement of the cutoff frequency for the second stage filter will generally occur at the second zero of the first stage PID control.
Now, it should be noted that it may be possible to create something like a Type 3 amplifier with PID feedback. However, the placement of the necessary cutoff points is not likely to yield a manageable compensator transfer function and will be much more difficult to analyze and work with. So, we normally recommend that PID is fine if the solution can be achieved with Type 2 compensation. But if you need Type 3, then it's best to choose a processor that can implement a true Type 3 feedback. So, when talking about digital controllers, we still have the Type 1, Type 2, and Type 3 amplifier implementations that we are familiar with from the analog world but now we also include the PID type amplifier often used in the digital world. K-Factor is one of our most useful aids in synthesizing amplifiers to determine the cutoff frequencies for our poles and zeros for our amplifier transfer function. The rules governing application of the K-Factor to determine the cutoff frequencies still apply in digital systems and can also be applied to the PID amplifier as well. This is something that we continue to do in our Venable software package to synthesize the transfer function for the PID. In order to apply K-Factor within the tools we provide in our Venable software package, we make a translation of our digital measurements to analog before applying the K-Factor algorithms. Our tool sets incorporate the use of the bilinear transform, also known as Tustin's method, and pre-warping correction, to attain the best possible conversion of digital data to analog. Of course, it should be noted that no conversion technique can produce a perfect analog translation of the digital data. Because the data update rates of the key digital parameters are typically tied to the set frequency of the pulse width controller in the target processor, we will generally see a phase discrepancy develop as we approach the Nyquist frequency of our system, and this will have to be accounted for in our interpretation of the plotted measurements. This will be illustrated in a later slide. To perform proper measuring of a digitally controlled loop, there are a few things that must be considered. First, injection must be a sine wave. One of the downsides of the attempts to perform injection within the target processor is the limitation to trapezoidal and square wave signals as they approach the Nyquist frequency of the modulator. This will introduce harmonics into the system and generally result in poor frequency response results. Next, we need to measure the power and compensator blocks. As these measurement points are within the processor, digital interface access to the processor is required to extract this data information. We need to keep the loop closed to be able to measure each block. Opening the loop in the digital world is the same as opening the loop in the analog world. In a digital situation, opening the loop means breaking the communication path, and this can cause erroneous data on the input at the break. This will cause wild fluctuations downstream in the digital path, resulting in uncontrollable operation of the blocks downstream. In order to extract the required information from the target processor, some type of software code is required to operate in the target processor. However, we do not want this code to affect the closed loop operation of the target processor to any significant degree so we need to keep the footprint of any code we add into the target processor software to the absolute minimum. Any kind of frequency response analysis is generally too extensive to fit within the processing constraints of the typical digital processor that will be used in power applications. As a result, our solution at Venable Instruments is to only add code to the target processor to extract the required elements from it and perform all injection and signal data processing off the target within our analyzer. Proper phase correlation requires us to account for the sampling and time delays inherent in both the target processor and our digital interface within the Venable analyzer. Fortunately, these delays are deterministic and can be corrected for which we do within our processing algorithms. Also, correlation between the analog data and the digital data must be done and is performed within the analyzer. Finally, we need to always keep in mind that phase disparity in our measurements of our digital data will grow as we get close to the Nyquist frequency of the modulator in our target system, and we will need to be able to recognize this in interpreting our data plots. In order to understand how we must measure and analyze a digital base control loop, we first need to understand the basic structure of the feedback system.
The power supply will consist of an analog section that makes up the power stage of the power supply. This will generally consist of a powertrain module and the output filter. Then we have the digital controller that will include an A to D converter that will sense the output, the digital compensator, and the PWM pulse train generator. In order to measure the compensator, we need to measure the output level of the error amplifier and the input level to the pulse width module generator. But since these measurement points exist within the digital controller, we cannot obtain these measurements with existing analog measuring techniques. We must therefore have a method to interface to the digital controller stage of our power supply and extract these values from it. In order to understand this system with respect to how we measure it, we will modify how we look at this system as follows. The analog stage of our feedback system will include the A to D and the PWM generator from the digital controller. Timing delays resulting between the DPWM and the power processing block will be included in the transfer function for the analog stage. We now have four measurement points in the system. The injection and analog measurement points remain the same as they do for an analog based system and will still be used to plot your total feedback loop. We also now have two digital points, E and U, that will allow us to measure the transfer function of the compensator. Also using these four points, we can measure and plot the power stage and compensator separately. Although the AD is now between its own two measurement points, you will generally find that the plot of this piece is quite flat with unity gain and zero phase, because the sampling speed of the AD is normally significantly faster than the switching frequency and so it can be disregarded in most cases. In order to support this new approach to feedback designs, we at Venable developed a new analyzer that allows us to measure each point in a digitally controlled system and be able to directly correlate the analog and digital measurements in order to be able to plot the transfer functions of each section within the feedback loop. This analyzer has the generator and two voltage inputs that you may be familiar with on our other products. It also adds the digital port that allows us to connect to a target processor with a communication interface. We also provide a small footprint software set for you to compile into your target processor to communicate with our analyzer. The analyzer will also have the capability to turn the digital interface off by the user so that the analyzer can still be used as a standard two-channel analog analyzer. When the unit is configured with the digital interface active, it can be operated up to a maximum bandwidth of 1 MHz. When the unit is configured in analog only mode, it can be operated to the full specification of our standard analyzers, including bandwidth options of 5, 20, and 40 MHz. Here we have the control menu for the Venable Analyzer. Along with the standard controls, we have added two new blocks. One is the options box, which allows us to enable or disable the digital interface within the analyzer. This is a toggle control that changes the state each time a particular item is selected and will allow us to still use the unit as a standard two-channel analog analyzer. The second item is the digital interface measurements block. This block displays amplitude and phase information for the error amplifier and PWM output of the digital stage. Also included are limiting factors for each to prevent overdriving the digital stage. These settings act as a servo type control to reduce injection amplitude if the stated limits are hit and keep us within the performance constraints of the target processor. Once we have all the parameters set the way we want them, we hit the Run Sweep button to execute a sweep of the targeted power supply. Once our sweep is complete, we can plot the transfer function of each section of the power supply from the data that was collected. In this case, we want to look at the resulting transfer function of the control to output stage, as shown here. Using the slider function built into our software, we choose our desired crossover point. The data from the slider selection will be automatically pulled into our analysis tools. From our menu, we pull up the digital compensator synthesis and analysis menu. For those of you familiar with our error amplifier synthesis menu, you will notice similarities to this menu with some additions related to digital control. The left side of the menu has the same parameter inputs as the other synthesis menu, with one notable addition. The sampling period parameter is added to enter the modulator frequency of the target processor. This will also end up being our bandwidth constraint as well. 
We can then plot the transfer function of our new coefficients as shown here on plot number 2. This gives us our synthesized compensator transfer function. From here, we can generate a plot of the predicted total loop by multiplying these two transfer functions. We do this by accessing our math menu from the menu ribbon. In the center of the dialog box, we choose the math action we want to occur. In this case, multiply. On the left side, we select our first plot to multiply. On the right side, we select our second plot to multiply and then hit OK. The result from the math function is displayed here as plot number 3. With our target power supply now operating with the new coefficients programmed in, we return to the analyzer control menu and run another sweep with the same settings as the first sweep we did. The resulting closed loop response we get is plotted here as plot number 4 for comparison against our predicted plot. Using the slide bar tool, we can check the new phase margin for the loop at unity gain. In the example shown here, we are measuring a system that has a modulator operating at a sampling rate of 300 kHz. From the two plots, we can readily see how the phase measurements diverge as we approach the Nyquist frequency of 150 kHz. Plot number 3 is a math product of a combination of analog and digital measurements. From it, we see that the phase does not roll off as fast as the actual total loop plot, plot number 4. This is a direct result of the increasing phase measurement error that occurs from the data update rate tied to modulator in the target processor as we approach its Nyquist frequency. This phenomenon always needs to be recognized and understood by the developer in interpreting mixed signal plots. To sum up, our mixed signal analysis will provide you the following capabilities. The user will be using a calibrated instrument to perform measurements which provides them with external validation of the loop design. The system will be tested by injecting a pure analog sine wave to achieve the best possible measurements and results. The loop will remain closed with all sections of the feedback loop measured with a single sweep. The footprint of the code to be compiled into the target processor is kept to an absolute minimum to ensure low memory impact. The code also uses very little processing resources by the processor in order to stay out of the way of the primary control code as much as is possible. All data produced from the analog and digital channels are processed using a discrete Fourier transform algorithm to achieve the best noise rejection. Finally, the Venable Windows software provides the tools to automate the design process significantly and generates the coefficients required by the design. Thank you for your time and please visit us at www.venable.biz for more info on the 8805 and our other 11 frequency response analyzers.